in this lesson, we want to talk about finding the zeros of a polynomial function. All right, so now it's time to take all the things we've been talking about over the last few lessons and apply it to a real world example. So we have f of x equals 5x cubed plus 12x squared plus 54x plus 20. So if you got this problem on your test and your teacher said, find the zeros for this polynomial function, what would you do? Well, there's a lot of different strategies that you can employ here. But the first thing that I would do is I would look at the degree of the polynomial and we see that it's a three. So immediately I know that there's three solutions. Now there could be repeated solutions, but I know there's three solutions. Now, because the imaginary solutions, or again, the non-real complex solutions come in conjugate pairs, meaning there could be zero, there could be two, there could be four, so on and so forth. Well, that tells me that there's either one real solution and two imaginary solutions, or there's going to be three real solutions. Now, we can further break this down by thinking about, again, Descartes' rule of signs. Remember, you look at the sign changes with f of x. So this is positive, 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 positive. No sign changes in f of x, so there's zero real solutions that are positive, okay? So that tells me that all the real solutions are going to have to be negative. And you can verify this by doing f of negative x, okay? And so, again, when you do this, don't worry about the x because that part stays the same. It's the negative here that you're thinking about because it's a negative one that gets plugged in that's going to change the sign of that term if the exponent is odd. So there and also there, right? Because negative one raised to an odd power is negative one. That changes the sign. So in this particular case, you'd have negative 5x cubed. This wouldn't change because this is an even exponent. So plus 12x squared. This would change. It would be minus 54x and then plus 20. Okay. So we see that we have three sign changes here. You go from negative to positive, positive to negative, and negative to positive. So one, two, three sign changes. All right. So that means one scenario could be zero positive real solutions, three negative real solutions, and zero imaginary. And then again, we decrease that number by two. Okay. So we can have zero positive real solutions. Decrease this by two, you get to one. So negative real solutions, you'd have one in that case. And then this right here, imaginary, would have to be two now, right? Because the row always sums to three because you've got a degree of three for that polynomial. All right, so this already narrows things down for me. I know that in terms of real solutions, I'm only looking for negative ones, okay? So if I do my rational roots test, I can throw out all the positives. I don't even need to look at those. So now let's go to a fresh sheet and let's think about this rational roots test. So it's been a while since we talked about it. So let me refresh your memory. Remember, the polynomial needs to be in standard form, and you want to look at the leading coefficient. So this guy here is a 5. That's the leading coefficient because it's on x cubed. The third power is the highest power for this polynomial, right? This one's the second power, and this one's the first power. So this is the leading coefficient because, again, it's the coefficient on the variable raised to the highest power. So this is where I get my q's from, right? All the factors of 5. Then this, the constant term, is where I get my p's from. Okay, remember all the factors of 20. So think about the factors of 20. So I'm just going to put P here. 20 is going to be what? It's 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and also 20. And then for Q, again, all the factors of 5, you've got 1 and 5. And I know there's plus or minus in each case, but again, I'm just kind of trying to speed this up. We're going to be throwing out the positives anyway, so I'm just going to write everything, and then I'm going to put a negative sign in front of everything just to make it quicker, because in this case, we don't need plus or minus. We already know we don't have positive real solutions. Okay, so I've got to come up with all the possible P over Qs. So I'm going to start with the number 1. 1 over 1 would be 1, and then I'm just going to slap a negative on it. And then we'd have 1 over 5, which would be 1 fifth. Again, I'm going to put a negative on it. And then we'd have what? I moved down. So now you'd have 2 over 1, which is 2. So it'd be negative 2. And then 2 over 5 would be 2 fifths. So negative 2 fifths. And then moving down, we'd have 4 over 1, which is 4. So I'll put negative 4. And then 4 over 5 is 4 fifths. So negative 4 fifths. And then let's talk about we have 5. So we have 5 over 1. So that's negative 5. And then 5 over 5 is 1, right? So we already have negative 1. We don't need that. So then you'd have 10 over 1, which is 10, so I'll put negative 10. And then 10 over 5 is 2. Again, if I think about this in terms of negative 2, I already have that. Don't worry about it. You can just move on. So we have 20. 20 over 1 is 20, so I'll put negative 20. And then 20 over 5 is 4, 
We already have that. Again, we're changing the sign of negative 4. We already have that. So again, just so you're not lost, I didn't put plus or minus because we already know that there's no positive real solution. So that's why I only have negatives there. Okay, so let me erase all of this. And now we have a list of potential candidates, okay? So here's what I'm gonna tell you to do. And this sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. We talked about the upper and lower bound rules, okay? In the case where the leading coefficient is positive, which it is here, and you have a negative K, a negative value that you're doing your synthetic division with. Okay, we know that if the bottom row of that synthetic division alternates in sign, we found a lower bound, right? So there won't be a zero that is below that value or less than that value. So what I'm going to do, when I think about the integers here, forget about the fractions, I've got negative one, negative two, negative four, negative five, negative 10, negative 20. So I'm gonna pick something kind of in between. I'm just gonna go with negative four and I'm gonna see if it's a lower bound. And sometimes you do this and you end up with a zero. So I'm gonna take negative four and just do some synthetic division. So I'm gonna take five, I'm gonna take 12, I'm gonna take 54, and I'm gonna take 20. Okay, so let me come back up in a minute. I'm just gonna drop this down and see what we get. So negative four times five is negative 20. 12 plus negative 20 is negative eight. Negative four times negative eight is 32. 54 plus 32, well, four plus two is six, and five plus three is eight, so that's 86. And then negative four times 86 is going to be negative 344. 20 plus negative 344 is negative 324. Okay, so although we didn't find a zero here, we did figure out that negative four is a lower bound, right? Because the signs here, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive, this is negative. So they alternate. So again, that tells you if this guy is negative and this guy is positive and these guys alternate, you found a lower bound. Now, I wanna stop here and I wanna caution against a common mistake. If you had done this with negative four and you didn't find that it was a lower bound, that doesn't mean that it's not, okay? It only says that conclusively, you can say if these situations present themselves, so again, a negative, a positive, and alternating signs, then you do have a lower bound for sure, okay? So let's erase this and let's go back up. Now, I can take negative four off, I don't need it. I can take negative five off, negative 10 off, and negative 20 because those values are less than negative four, okay? So everything that I have now would be greater than negative four. Now, the next thing I would think about here, negative one is something easy to just plug in for. So I would just check that real quick. So all we would see is that, again, if you were plugging in a one, you would just erase all those X's and you would just straight add the coefficients, right? So if it's negative one, the sign of the coefficient would change if it's an odd exponent. So here and here, okay? So if we do this, let me kind of go up a little bit here. This would be negative and you can get rid of this, get rid of this, this would be negative. Okay, so negative five plus 12 is seven. Seven minus 54 is negative 47 and negative 47 plus 20 is negative 27. So I know negative one is not a zero. So F of negative one, let me write that down, it's negative 27. So I know this doesn't work, but something you can check really quickly is F of zero. So F of zero is what? This is all gone, it's just 20. Okay, so that takes a millisecond. Now, the reason I did that is because of the intermediate value theorem. All these fractions here, negative one fifth, negative two fifths, and negative four fifths, they're between zero and negative one, on the number line. So, because this guy is positive and this guy is negative, again, the intermediate value theorem tells us that for sure, we're gonna have a real zero between zero and negative one, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is just clean up a little bit. So let me rewrite these fractions. So we have negative one-fifth, we have negative two-fifths, and we have negative four-fifths. And then we have negative two, okay? But I'm gonna work with these fractions because again, I know that there's a zero between zero and negative one. Okay, so let's start with negative one fifth. So if this is a zero, again, we use our synthetic division. So the remainder would be zero if this is a zero. So I'm gonna put negative one fifth like this. And this is a little bit harder because you're working with a fraction, but if you have a calculator, it's not too bad. So we got five, we got 12, we got 54, and we have 20. Okay, so let me scroll down and get some room. I'll pop back up in a moment. So let's bring this down. And so negative one fifth times five, we know that the denominator of five here would cancel with this guy, which is a five, okay? So I'd be left with just negative one in that case. 
So this is going to be negative 1. 12 plus negative 1 is 11. Then negative 1 fifth times 11. This would be negative, okay? We know 11 times 1 is 11, and this is over our denominator of 5. So here's where it gets a little tricky. You've got to get a common denominator going because you have 54 plus negative 11 fifths. So let's do that over here. So 54 plus, you've got negative 11 fifths. And you can just put minus if you want. Doesn't matter. So for the 54, I need a common denominator. So I'm going to times it by 5 over 5. 54 times 5 is 270, right? 50 times 5 is 250 and 4 times 5 is 20 so this would be 270. Okay so if I subtract 270 minus 11 that's 259 so this would be 259 fifths. So 259 fifths. Okay so now we want to multiply negative 1 fifth times 259 fifths. So what is that? So negative 1 fifth times 259 fifths 5 times 5 is 25, and negative 1 times 259 is negative 259. So negative 259 over 25. Okay, so negative 259 over 25. All right. So now to do this final addition, we want to multiply this by 25 over 25. So this would be 500 over 25. Okay, so 500 over 25. And 500 minus 259 is 241, so this would be 241 over 25. Now, this is not zero, and so we can say that this negative one-fifth here is not a zero, right? So it doesn't work. So let me just erase this, and let me put this back to 20, and let me erase this, and let me scooch up here for a second, and let me get rid of this one, and let's go to the next one, which is negative two-fifths. All right, so we're gonna repeat this process again, drop this down, Negative 2 fifths times 5, the 5s would cancel, you'd have a negative 2. 12 plus negative 2 is 10. Okay, so now negative 2 fifths times 10, you think about 5 and 10, the 10 would cancel with the 5 and give you 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. So 54 plus negative 4 is 50. 50 times negative 2 fifths, again, 50 divided by 5 is 10. 10 times negative 2 is negative 20. Aha, we found it. 20 plus negative 20 is 0. Okay, so we know that negative two-fifths is a zero. Okay, so we want to erase this. Keep those numbers down there. You need them. I'm going to erase this. We don't really need this because we have one zero, and we're taking it down to a quadratic, so we'll quickly find the other ones. So I'm going to go ahead and say that for the zeros, one of them right now we know is negative two-fifths. Okay, so that's one of them. So the next thing I'm going to think about is the fact that synthetically I divided this by x plus two-fifths, right? x minus a negative two-fifths is x plus two-fifths. So the result here is going to be a quadratic. So this would be 5x squared plus 10x plus 50. So where does this equal zero? Now to make this a little bit easier, if you're just trying to find out where this is equal to zero, I could divide everything by five, so I'm working with smaller numbers, because this is divisible by five, so is this, so is this. And if I divide this by 5, I get 0 anyway, right? So it's fine. It's not going to affect anything. It's just going to make your, your life easier. So what I'm going to say is we have x squared plus, this would be 2x plus 10 equals 0. So this right here, again, we're just going to use the quadratic formula. So my a is going to be 1. My b is going to be 2. My c is going to be 10. If I think about this, it's what? x is equal to... Negative b, in this case b is 2, so negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so b is 2, 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times a, a is 1, times c, c is 10, so 4 times 10 is 40. This is all over 2 times a, again a is 1, so just 2. So 4 minus 40 is negative 36, and we know if we pull that negative out, it would be i, right, the imaginary unit. So I can say this is i times the square root of 36, which is 6, so you can put 6i here. And basically, you could factor out a 2. Let me erase this. We don't need this anymore. You could factor out a 2, and so you could say x is equal to, put a 2 out here, and then inside the parentheses, you would have negative 1, plus or minus, you would have 3i, and then over 2, and you can cancel this with this, okay? So because this is divisible by 2, and this is divisible by 2, Again, you can factor that out and cancel and make this more simple. 
So let's erase these. And so we found our other two solutions, our other two zeros. So one of them would be negative one plus three i, and the other is going to be negative one minus three i. So at this point, if you want to stop the video and check these solutions by plugging them in, be my guest, but I can promise you they work. So I know this was a bit tedious, but it's good to go through a harder example. That way, if you get something like this on a test, you know what to do.